So hello everyone. Um, welcome to History Fox, which is me. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. We have a very special guest today, which I'm very honored to accept my invitation to interview, which is uh, Professor Hakim Adi. Thank you so much for joining today. I will introduce you like very shortly for those who don't know you. When I um, yeah, did my research about you, I figured there are like three pillars of your work, of your life. And I would say that you yourself are already history because you're the first African-British uh, history professor in the UK, right? Um, and considering I read those numbers you mentioned, um, that there are like 18,000 professors in the UK and considering only 85 of them are like black or from an ethnic minority, which is like 0.5% if I calculated correctly. So there's already a very small number of, of those people. And you are the only one, the only uh, African British. In fact, there are, at the moment, there are three. There are three history professors of African heritage. But obviously, when I became a professor, I was the first. So there was, it was just me. But happy to hear that it's now three. Yeah, you were the first. <laughs> That's impressive. And the second pillar, I would say, is this your approach in your master research program of this kind of what you call, I think, transformative education, right? That you want to include um, the African Caribbean narrative in the curriculum, that it's not only like in this kind of white Eurocentric point of view, how history was written so far, but that we also include now other voices, that it's not like only the transatlantic uh, slave trade that involves African people or black people or the um, American civil rights movement, but that it's more to, yeah, history of Africa or the African diaspora and that those two things. The third pillar, I would say, is of course that you're an author. Your most famous works, I think, are about pan-Africanism and or the latest one from 2022 was about African and Caribbean people in British history, like 700 pages, the vast research you did there, but also like you did research about the relationship between pan-Africanism and communism, which is very interesting, I think. Um, you also wrote uh, children's books, additionally, and you're an activist. You um, founded this group, this um, History Matters group, so which is kind of concerned with the under-representation um, of yeah, African or Caribbean people of color, teachers uh, or academics in universities and college. Yeah. Yeah. Students, students and, uh, well, students and the history that is taught in schools, universities, and so on. Yeah. So that's four, isn't that four pillars, not three? I, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so many numbers. <laughs> yeah. But I also wanted to mention that you are a co-founding member of the BASA. Awesome. Um, yeah. Which is the Black and Asian Studies Association. So it's also among academics, right? It was mainly amongst people who were interested in this particular history, the history of African, Caribbean, and South Asian people in Britain, just trying to get everyone together. And, and in fact, when we started it, there weren't really any, any academics involved. In fact, for most of its life, She's over been... about 15 years, there weren't any academics involved because, because there, were, there may be one or two, one or two, but the main people involved were not academics. Okay. So it was more like, yeah, as you say, people who maybe did not study, but are interested in yeah, we're interested, maybe independent historians or, yeah, I think I was probably the only person who was, could be considered an academic when we, yeah, we, when we started, I was still a, a PhD student. So it was people who were researching the history, but as I say, most of those were independent historians, not academic historians. We also had some people, I think, who were teachers or who were just interested in the subject and the aim was to to get them together and to campaign for more recognition for this aspect of history to be included in the school curriculum, but also to be highlighted in libraries, in museums, in archives, everywhere. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your, where your interest in history, history initially came from, and especially in this kind of, yeah, underrepresented history. Like, I guess. You noticed that at a certain point that there's like a leg, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and it's very good to be here and I appreciate the invitation. I'm, it's great to be, to be asked to, to say something about anything. So thank you for that. 
My interest in history started when I, w- I was very young, not in this particular history at first. I was interested in history as a very young child, about probably four or five years old. And I, as I tell people now, my main interest in history was because of a, a television program about a man, a very famous figure in English. I would say history, but more his- English mythology or myth and legend. Somebody called Robin Hood, who now has been made world famous by various Hollywood films and so on. But that story, people are unclear about whether Robin Hood really existed or not, but it's, it's set in a very definite, you know, medieval period, very, very, very definite period of the time of English King Richard the first and so on. But that, that fascinated me just the fact that there was a program on television about this person. And of course the main quality of Robin Hood was that he defended uh, the poor and the weak and uh, he took from the rich and gave to the poor. So he was a very, uh, a revolutionary figure, he could say. And in fact, that, that series, I didn't know that at the time, but the series was actually written by many people who had been, the term is blacklisted by the McCarthyites regime, or we can call it in the United States during the 1950s. So many people in Hollywood who were script writers and who were communists mm. barred from working in Hollywood during that period. But some of them using aliases of various kinds worked on this Robin Hood series. So whether that gave it a particularly revolutionary or communistic character, I don't know, but it appealed to me very much as a child. So that was my first interest in history. And so I used to read or be given books about history and I always loved history as a young child, but my interest in, in the history of Africa and the diaspora began when I was a teenager, probably about 13 or 14 years old and was as a result of growing up in the particular society that I grew up in, which in those days was very, to me anyway, was a very racist society. And it was just my experience as a, a child, a young person growing up and the racism that I faced on the streets or in the playground or wherever, and trying to find something positive because obviously, or maybe not obviously at school, I didn't learn anything about Africa or anything. I mean, everything was focused on a general kind of Eurocentric history. And so it was my search to, to, to find things which could sustain me as a young person, sustain my identity, my, my sense of my, my own worth in society and so on. And so that's when I began to look, to seek out books about the history of Africa or anything to do with Africa or black people generally. It could have been about music. I read a lot of things about the history of jazz, history of the blues. I read novels, but I also read books about history. And so that was where it started. And then I decided also at a very young age that I wanted to be a history teacher. And at that time, this would have been the early 1970s. In this country, there was the beginnings of an attempt to integrate the history of Africa, the Caribbean and so on within the history curriculum in one or two places. It wasn't very developed, but there were the beginnings of that idea. And I, I'm not quite sure how I found out about that, but I found out that that was a possibility. And so I thought, okay, if I can learn, go and study African history, I can become a school teacher. And I can teach to young people like me the history that I didn't have. So that's really where it all began. Yeah, that's that's so nice. I also, you know, now you're mentioning the books that you read. I read that the book that changed you the most is A.L. Morton's The History of People in Britain. Well, that I read later. I read that when I was probably in my early 20s. So I read other books. I would say that... The book that probably impressed me the most when I was a teenager was a book called The Myth of the Negro Past, written by an American professor called Melville Herskovitz. And his thesis essentially was that the culture of Africa had kind of been preserved and manifested itself in various ways in American society. That last putting it very simply, but that's basically what he looked at. So he would have looked at other things like, obviously like music, food, various other cultural aspects, language. So that was very important to me because it dealt with two 
essentially racist ideas, if you like. One, that Africa had no history. Two, that, you know, people who had been through human trafficking, been transported to the Americas, had lost all their African culture and so on and so forth. And thirdly, the fact that this culture was, was alive and well and having a major impact on not only U.S. society, but also world society mm -hmm. and culture and so on. So as a, as a young person, that appealed to me very much. But in general, I was interested in everything relating to Africa, its diaspora. I read political things by Franz Fanon. I read Stokely Carmichael's Black Power. I read books on history, everything, anything I could find. And, and remember, these are the days before the internet. So it was a question of finding what was in a bookshop, looking in the bibliography, maybe seeing something else and ordering it or that kind of thing. So, but A.O. Moulton came later when I was, you know, I'd become much more kind of political. I, I can't remember who introduced me to it, but I read it in order to understand more about the history of, of England and Britain. It's a very good book. It's a very good book for understanding the developments of history, not only the details of history, but how things develop why they develop yeah it's written from a you know a marxist perspective yeah um, but it, it gives a very 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 good analysis of how yeah how history develops through struggle the fact that there are you know different classes in contention with each other and how that plays out and so on so that was a that was also a, a yeah an important book yeah i i tried to start reading it <laughs> And uh, it starts with a, with a quote, I think, right by William Morris. Wait, I, I noted it somewhere. And then I thought I did not really understand that. There was written, ill would change be at wilds, were it not for the change beyond the change. Oh, wow. I'm not sure. The change beyond the change. What is the change beyond the change? I'm not sure. I'd have to read the whole poem maybe to get a sense of. Uh, I thought it might be about that change at first might be, yeah, struggling might affect you, might be painful, but then the change that comes later might be worth it or something. It could well be. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the key thing is the change that that's the key thing, which history shows us. Yeah. And I often say that history is the study of change. Yeah. So what is key is that there is change because in our world, the, the powers tell us there is no change. Yeah. You know, they, they even have a whole theory about the end of history and all this kind of thing. So. The fact that everything is undergoing change constantly. So we're undergoing change. Our bodies are changing all the time. The world is changing all the time. Everything is in motion. Wow. That is very, very important just to establish that. Once you establish everything changes, it gives you great optimism uh, because you know that what is, is not going to endure. It's just transitory, uh, including the society that we live in. It's not fixed. It's not permanent. It's just here for a time. It's in crisis. There needs to be something else. And then you start looking, okay, well, what might this something else be? So that's very, very important just to have that perspective that everything is change and everything is in change. So I don't know exactly what the quote relates to, but it certainly relates to that, which is very, very important. I just thought there are some similarities because the book of Morton, it's more a different kind of how to tell history, right? I felt like it's more about the people who make history. It's not about only battles or those great white generals who you know start a new age it's actually like coming from people and yeah. i also said that in your articles or in your books you give the history or the historical literature a human face or a more multi faceted face it's it's not just um, one dimension there are like multiple perspectives and there are multiple people behind it who make history and it's not enforced always by the one lone wolf or genius That's also very important that we, we understand history in that way, that it's the majority of people who make history. It's not the, the, the great individuals and so on. And obviously we're often taught history from the perspective of the, the white men of property, as you say, the, the kings, the generals, the politicians and so on, but they are very often products of you know, a particular kind of society. If you just study their battles, you don't actually understand what, why were these battles being fought, whose interests were represented in these battles and so on. And, you know, in British history, many of the great battles were fought over, you know, conquering other people's countries. 
or dividing the world or were part of colonial conquests and so on. So you have to kind of understand that and then you can appreciate, okay, what was the, the significance or importance of these people? But again, battles are not fought by generals. The generals don't do anything. In fact, only the other day I was watching on TV a very good film called Oh, What a Lovely War, which is a very, it was originally a musical huh? a played show. It's about the First World War, but it's the First World War told partly through song, through the songs of the time. So it's, you could say it's an anti-war film in that it exposes the reality of war and if you like the, the kind of propaganda of war. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure in Germany, well, I don't know how it's taught in Germany, but in, in, in this country, if we go back to the centenary of the First World War, the politicians, in fact, tried to present the war in a certain way. So for example, they say, well, it was all the Germans. The problem with the First World War is German militarism. That's the problem. Well, the First World War wasn't about German militarism or any, any, any of the other things they say. So, oh, what a lovely war deals with it from the people's perspective. And one of the things it highlights is the generals are sitting, you know, miles away from the war, making the most stupid decisions and, you know, slaughtering half a million people a day or hundreds of thousands of people a day. So yes, the point is, the point I was making was that war is fought by the ordinary people who die in it, while the great generals or so-called great generals just, you know, are miles away and making all the wrong decisions and so on. So, you know, we, we need a history, which is about us the majority of people and helps also to explain how things change. And generally they change because the majority of people are acting in a certain way. And that shows us that we are the, the makers of history. Now, once you understand, first of all, that everything changes. And secondly, that you're the change maker, that gives you a very definite perspective on the world in which you live and great optimism for the future. The powers that be tell you a history where everything is fixed and the only people who change things are the white men of property. And of course that presentation suits their interests because they don't want anybody else to do anything. So we have to have a history, not only that favors our interests, but which is actually true, is accurate and yeah. reflects what, what goes on. So, so yeah, Morton's book and others, other books, which have that same perspective, you know, are very important. Yeah, I, I can imagine that I'm not sure when this kind of, you know, a few of values or few of the world um, developed in yourself, but I can imagine that when you start started to study history in UK, that it did not always met sympathy, did not always, you know, was received so well. So I, I just wanted to ask you about if you met like certain struggles while you tried to study what you want to study or show what you want to show, you know. First of all, as I've just indicated, just to present history from a different perspective, from the perspective of the majority is always a challenge because the, the powers that be have, have kind of established yeah. history should be told in this way. You know, it's about this, it's about the white men of property and so on. So that when you adopt a different perspective, that's very difficult. Then if you also say, well, actually, I want to look at history from the perspective of, of Africa and Africans, that is sort of doubly difficult because most of that history is not taught in schools, not taught in universities. If you look at, the, for example, the history of African and Caribbean people in Britain, it's, it's still not taught. It's, it's hidden, you're, you know, you're seen as being, you know, raising a question that is almost, you know, almost ridiculous. In this country, we have a, a museum called the Imperial War Museum. There's a part of this in London and one or two other cities. And I remember going to speak to the director and you'd think something called the Imperial War Museum would actually at least have something about the empire in it. But this museum, I remember going there about 30 years ago and talking to the director and saying, look, this is called the Imperial War Museum. So how is it you don't have anything related to Africa or Africans, for example? And we probably said, or well, Asia and Asians as well. And he more or less, you know, listened very politely and then kind of showed us the door. You know, there was not even any discussion really about this thing. It was to him, it was just such a, an outlandish suggestion mm -hmm. that this it should include. Now it's all, now it's different. You go to the museum today, everyone will say, oh, of course, you know, we have this, we have that. But 30 years ago, even that was not accepted. So it's always difficult. 
you know, as you know, my current employment or previous employments of where we tried to develop this history. I taught various courses on the history of Africa and the African diaspora. We set up the master's program. We attracted master's level students. We distracted PhD students. We have the biggest cohort of black postgraduate students in the country. The universe just come along and said, okay, we're going to close that. We're going to sack you. We're going to, so that is whatever the, is said is contempt for this history is saying, this is not of any importance. If we get rid of it, if we make one of only three black professors redundant, doesn't matter. So it's very, very difficult. And then of course you have people who are openly racist attacking you as they attack me. And, you know, so yes, it's very, very difficult, but it's a struggle, but life is, life is a struggle, you know, as the famous American activist, Frederick Douglass said, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. And the whole of human history is struggle, struggle against nature, struggle and so on. So it's tiring, but, but it sort of comes with the territory and yeah, you just keep struggling, trying. The key thing is to be involved with other people, to encourage others, to take up the struggle. These are, you know, kind of key things for, as I say, the presentation of the, the truth to be able to represent the majority of people. These are our, our rights to understand where we are in the world, why the world is the way it is, what our role is in changing it, that we're entitled to know these things. And so we keep fighting for that. That's very, that's very true. I was wondering when I read a little bit about your yeah life, you were mentioning once that when you started, I think it was at SOAS in London, right? that there was no black or people of color teaching you, no professor. Yeah. And that yeah. one day there was like a lady coming from the USA yeah. to teach and, and you gathered around her because finally there was, there was some kind of representation. But by reading that, I was just wondering, so was the USA back then kind of a little bit more advanced and, and the UK was a little bit more? Yeah. And it still is. The US is much more advanced than Britain because a, because it has a bigger black population yeah. okay. and secondly, because they've waged, you know, very big struggles in the 1960s, 1970s and, and before and after to establish this kind of history is, is taught and that African-Americans and others are represented in universities and in schools and so on and so forth. So that's been a, a struggle that's been waged, you know, for many years or more, getting on for two centuries, maybe. I should point out that the incident at SOAS was somebody was just, she was just visiting. She just spoke on two occasions. Then she went back to, or went to wherever she went. So though that was the only occasion where we had the possibility to be, to even listen to somebody, to a black person speaking. In those days at SOAS, even African languages were not taught by Africans. Yeah. So, <laughs> Uh, probably Asian language weren't, weren't talked about people from Asia as well. I can't remember, but that was the situation. It's changed a little bit maybe, but it's still problematic. And as I said before, and we still have a problem in this country where, you know, young black people are turned off history yeah. because the, the history teaching they get in schools and even universities is very Eurocentric. And people say, why well, should I study this history? It's not about me. You know, it's so that those problems of representation you know, still exists. And in fact, somebody was telling me the other day that she teaches at a, a college not far in London. She said she is very enthusiastic. She encourages all these local kids, different backgrounds to study history. And they're all very enthusiastic because she includes a lot of, you know, black people in Britain and the US and so on. They all get very excited and they go off to university and that's Eurocentric and they all get disillusioned don't want to leave. And I mean, that's just such a terrible thing. You, you can't even uh, explain it in a way that you grow up in a world that uh, it essentially claims that you don't exist. Yeah, exactly. People, you know, it's like having a world where the women don't exist. Yeah. Everything you learn about is about men. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's very damaging, actually very, very damaging to everybody concerns. And you know, when I started at the University of Chichester, 11 years ago, I taught a course called Africa and the African diaspora in the modern world. It was a first year undergraduate course, just giving a survey about Africa, the Caribbean, the US, Britain, 
from pre-slavery, slavery, any of oh, different things, just a very general course. And I taught a group of kids, I think maybe about 60 kids, all white. And in my first semester, my first 12 weeks of that the university, they voted that course, the course of the year, the module of the year, throughout the whole university. And if you ask, you know, why do they, what, why do they like it? They said, well, we've never, we've never been taught this history. This is so interesting. This, we, this is so fascinating. We learn so many things. We understand things. This is just in 12 weeks. So think of the impact you could have if this kind of history was taught to everybody. And that's on white kids, what they have missed. But if you're, if you're a black child, you know, you grow up in this society, in this world, which kind of negates your existence and your ancestors and your family and everything. It's very, very difficult. I remember what it was like when I was a kid. That's a long time ago. <laughs> it's still going on today. And it, it, we really need to put a, put a stop to it. it it's, it's pervasive. And uh, just to give you one other example, I remember not very long ago, maybe about five years ago or 10 years ago, some, somewhere around there, there was a program on the BBC about the history of mathematics. I said, okay, okay, I'm going to watch this program. My wife said to me, don't watch it. I said, no, I'm going to watch it. I just want to see what they say. Okay. So we have this program on the history of mathematics. The first thing it says, mathematics, you know, and it starts talking about ancient Greece. Now, why would you begin a history of mathematics in Greece? When everybody knows all the Greek mathematicians studied in Egypt, mm. there's no mention of Egypt. There's no mention of China. This is, and this is just a few years ago. Why would you, I mean, it's, it's just beyond belief almost that you start a history of mathematics in Greece. It's just so, it's the very definition of Eurocentrism. Yes. But this is a world in which we live where these things are kind of taken for granted and, you know, churned out. And it has a very, you know, a very big impact on how people think, how they see the world, how they see their place in the world and so on. And it gives them basically a false picture of everything. And it's that false picture, which can be so harmful that we need to address. I think so too. It's about, yeah, representation and education. Like I don't want to blame anyone in my surrounding, but you know, I talked to a friend and he was watching my videos about the African decolonization and independence movements. He's very like open-minded and, you know, progressive, I would say young. And, you know, so he had fun watching this, but he said he had no idea. He, he thought that the Africans or the black people, they kind of arranged themselves uh, to be colonized and that then, you know, Europe came and they were like, okay, now you're decolonized. That's fun. That, that actually was like a centuries long struggle and that they, they continuous fighting and this kind of suppression, which still continues, and this kind of stereotypes and racism, we still have kind of inherited in our thinking, daily lives, and the, the wordings we choose, how we talk, when you, or you say like representation, you know, how even like something mundane as the documentary about mathematics, we don't include other perspectives, or, or not, not just other perspectives, but or origin actually of mathematics, yeah. which is actually crucial in the story. I think this is also why I studied, yeah, started to get more into world history, history of the global South, because I felt like there's a lack. I felt like there's something missing. And it actually started, you know, with, yeah, more kind of, yeah, feminist point of view of the world that I was thinking, okay, there's some cool, great white dude making history, but that can't be all. And then, you know, then kind of the curtain drops. And then you see that there's much more. And then there's like all those new stories. And I thought that's very inspirational. And also when I read a little bit in your book, your newest book, I mean, it's about African and Caribbean people in Britain, but that kind of also inspires me to do a little bit of research about yeah, black people, African people in Germany, which I did not know about so much. So there's like also another universe opening up now. Or when you were writing about the Cheddar Man of the black tutors and everything. Sometimes, you know, you read about this in like tiny articles, and but it's not like included in, in, the, in the narrative. Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, Cheddar Man, I mean, Cheddar Man, those people who look like Cheddar Man would have been in Germany too. Yeah, probably. Everybody in Europe would have looked like Cheddar Man 10,000 years ago. That's just where it was. It's not a big deal, but that's, in a way, it is a big deal because 
again, it changes the way we look at our histories and, uh, again, every, everything changes and so on. So yeah, it's just telling things as they are, just presenting things accurately. That's what's so important that it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a big deal. It shouldn't be a struggle. But then we have to look also why it is a struggle because the kind of false presentation of history, the Eurocentric presentation of history, what can you say? It meets the needs of very particular interests. And so to, to be aware of that is, I think is also very important. Yeah. Maybe you can also just quickly tell something about uh, the Cheddar Man and the Black Tudors. I'm not sure if the audience knows so much about them. Yeah. I mean, Cheddar Man is a uh, name given to a skeleton that was discovered near Cheddar Gorge in the west of England, I think about, about a century ago, maybe, maybe even a bit more, but a little bit more, but anyway, about a century ago, he is often represented as one of the first Britons. He existed about 10,000 years ago. And previously there was a kind of reconstruction of Cheddar Man. I'm not sure exactly now for exactly for what evidence he was reconstructed, but he, he was always presented as blonde hair and blue eyed and so on. And generally Aryan looking in appearance, you could say. But more recently, there with the latest DNA analysis, it, it's possible to get all kinds of information about hair and skin color and physical features and, and other things. And so some research was done and it showed that Cheddar Man didn't have, you know, pale skin and blonde hair and blue eyes, but dark skin, yeah. and dark hair, but also blue eyes. Uh, so he was dark skinned and so on. So when this information came out, the, the, all the newspapers here, including the, the ones that you would say would probably be less, least favorable to that evidence. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the headlines were, you know, things like the first Britons were black and, you know, these kinds of headlines were in all the major papers. And the key thing about Cheddar Man or the research done on him was that he's not just an isolated individual that most Europeans at that time would have looked, men and women, of course would have looked like Cheddar Man in that period. So Cheddar Man himself or what, those people who inhabited Europe didn't come directly from Africa. They probably came, yeah. in, their ancestors came from Africa as everybody's ancestors did. But it, it just shows that if you like black people, if you want to use that term, were mm. in Europe 10,000 years ago and so on. And it shows us that everything changes. And then in the book, I talk about some of the evidence or information we have, and obviously it's not necessarily that extensive, but certainly during the Roman period, there were, there were Africans living in Britain. Some Roman emperors actually came from Africa. Most famous is a guy called Septimius Severus. He came from what is today Libya, and he brought with him African troops. There has been some analysis of other skeletons found, which when they reconstructed have shown African women. African children and so on. So the more that we dig into the past, then the Roman occupation was about 1700 years ago in this country. And of course, the Romans also occupied other parts of Europe. So it's very, very likely that there were Africans in, you know, Germany 1700 years ago in France in, in other part, parts of Europe, because the Roman empire stretched throughout Europe and North Africa. And there was, you know, there were transactions and trade and so on and so forth. And then if we look later in English history, just to give one example from the, the seventh century, which is again, a very, very long time ago, there was a, a skeleton discovered or analyzed fairly recently of a young girl, about nine or 10 years old, who was buried not far from where I live in Southern England. And her DNA analysis was, was actually traced back to West Africa. And it's thought that probably not her personally, but probably her father, or more likely her grandfather came from what is today Nigeria. Now, how she or her father or her grandfather made that journey, what they were doing, we don't have that information. But what we do have is the information that people from Africa were here in very, very ancient times. In fact, possibly even before the Roman conquest. So what that tells us alone is that, you know, that in the tradition of English history, English history kind of dates from the Angles and Saxons. So actually there were Africans here before the Angles and Saxons, so before the ancestors of the English, if you take that view of the English. So some people get very upset about that. So no, 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 it can't be, possibly be true. So on, but these are just the kind of facts of life. And then of course, when you go from the period from the, the sort of eighth century onwards, we have a whole 
North African occupation of, of Spain, Southern France, and so on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then after the, the closure of that period, it's very likely that some of those people, some of those Africans from Spain and Portugal came to, to England. Of course, trade between England and Africa was beginning to develop in the 16th century. So some Africans came directly. So in Elizabethan times or Tudor times in England, there was an African population, a diverse population, probably of hundreds of people, you know, craftspeople, basket weavers, needle makers, divers, people who were property owners, a range of different people existed. And there are some records of them. Some were musicians, trumpeters at the Royal Court, a range of people. And so again, what this shows us is that probably kind of moving backwards, there were Africans here throughout the medieval period. The, the records are a bit slim because really not enough research has been done in that period, but that presence probably existed. And the other key thing about those people is that most of them were free people in the sense that anybody was free in that period. They weren't enslaved people necessarily. And that sort of status of Africans wasn't significant in this country before the, the 17th century. And so, yeah, so there's a whole history there, which again, is not, you know, it's not like it's necessarily a big deal. It's only a big deal because it's been excluded, because it's been hidden, because it's been denied, because there's this strange idea about the world, which we need to change. We need to fix. We need to show people that people moved around, they traveled, they, you know, they learned from each other. And very often in some cases, you know, people from Europe, especially from Northern Europe, traveled to Africa. Sometimes, you know, as a result of the crusades, the crusades were basically an excuse for um, Europeans to plunder yeah. North Africa, Western Asia, and to, to gather. The, the riches, both, both material riches and intellectual riches on those places. And at the same time, the Europeans traveled to, you know, to Spain to study and or Northern Europeans traveled to Spain to learn all the latest scientific discoveries that came through the Arab world and, and so on. So, yeah, I mean, these are things that just people should, should understand and be aware of and not have their view of the world maybe shaped by later centuries when the relationship between Africa and Europe changed. Because we have to remember that Europeans went to Africa, not because it was poor and backward, but because it was rich and advanced. And they wanted the things that Africa had, spices, gold, and so, which they didn't have, which they lacked. And so that was what began the voyages of exploration in the 15th century that then culminated or, or began to lead to this change in relationship and the trafficking of human beings in certain directions, which has shaped the world in which we live. Yes, yes. And then in the mid 20th century, the decolonization process happened, right? I think it's mostly also still taught like as some kind of event that happened, but it was actually like a long process, right? It was like decades happening. Yeah. I mean, you could say it was an arrested process because I'm always very wary about using the word or the term decolonization, because it maybe translates differently in different languages. But the, the French president Charles de Gaulle once said, decolonization is our interest, therefore it is our policy. When I think of decolonization, I think of the actions of the colonial powers. Okay. Yeah. When the British government talks about its decolonization or the French government or whatever, or the Belgian government decolonized, meaning what? Meaning <laughs> that they created the conditions to carry on the exploitation of Africa and other places as well. And then on the other hand, you have the anti-colonial struggle, which was waged in Africa, both before colonial rule, during colonial rule, and even after colonial so Now it's still being waged because the legacy of that period are the colonial borders, the colonial political systems, the colonial economic system, which are still, we still haven't been got rid of, haven't been. So in that sense, the anti-colonial struggle was kind of stifled, shall we say, diverted, truncated, arrested, whatever one wants to say in, in most places, but particularly where it was done in a kind of constitutional way, you know, but even in those countries where there were armed struggles, generally speaking, those structures are all still in place. South Africa is maybe quite a good example where, you know, so many people gave their lives in such a big struggle and as a global struggle but then at the key moment there's that historic 
compromise and everything's left intact. So the, you know, the apartheid state is there really, the, the economic system is there, everything is there. And then you kind of reform it and hope that it will, everything will change. It doesn't really change. You have black people run the state and some who've got quite rich and so on. But then a majority of people live in you know, better conditions, but all the problems which the systems, both economic and political and other systems have created remain, you know, poverty and homelessness and these days inadequate electricity supplies and violence, violence against women and, you know, all these problems can't be solved within those existing structures. Even if you go back to the Freedom Charter and look at the words of it, you know, and the great slogans of the time, you know, power to the people. Well, the people don't have power because they have no decision-making ability. You know, land should be returned to the people, everything, everything that the, the Charter says. Well, so why hasn't it been implemented? <laughs> That's the question. That's a great question, yeah. And it hasn't been. And I don't think people even discuss it these days, just to use it as an example. That was what people were fighting for, you could say. No, yeah. they haven't got it. Yeah. I was actually, I wanted to ask something about Pan-Africanism in this uh, regard, but now in South, South Africa, it reminds me, you also did some research about uh, Nelson Mandela, right? So I was always a little bit wondering because like in the Western world, he's kind of perceived as this yeah, enlightened figure who um, leads South Africa to freedom and to equality and to a bright future. But now you, that you say it's not that bright. It's not that, but I actually wrote a book for children about Nelson Mandela uh, and I was asked to write that book and I had some reservations about writing a book, writing a book on any individual. But what I tried to do in the book was actually talk about the struggle. So it does talk about him, but it also talks about the struggle that gave rise to him and, you know, what people were trying to do and so on. So that hopefully young people that read it can make up their own minds. I mean, there's no doubt that he was an important political figure. And as I say, came out of that struggle. You know, it's not necessarily to criticize him. Yeah. It's, although he, he definitely had a, his role to play, but those who were around him also made that compromise. And the key thing is he's been gone, however many years he's been gone. So there's a whole new generation who haven't dealt with those problems. You, you could say that he moves things to a definite stage and then it was for others to take up the baton as it were, and go to the next stage. And that's not really, really happening. Probably things have actually gone backwards in, in some ways. So, so yeah, the book's actually been translated, I think, into to Spanish by a publisher in Cuba. I think now I can, uh, we can come to the Pan-Africanist movement because he also did some research about that. And I was just thinking every time I read about the 60s and independence movements, they were all thriving to be like more of a united Africa in this kind of anti-colonial struggle. But now these days, is there still like this kind of pan-African movement or did it kind of die out? I mean, there's still the African Union, right? Yes, I think pan-Africanism is really the, the idea or the, yes, the, the notion that Africans should unite in order to liberate the African continent and liberate all Africans globally. The idea that Africans, people of African heritage have a, have a kind of common struggle, a common destiny and so on. So that unity is the key aspect there. And you can see how that idea emerged historically because particular problems that people faced in the, the 19th century, for example, where Africa was coming under colonial rule. People of African descent in the U.S. or the Caribbean were disenfranchised, were subject to racism, and so on and so forth. So it, it appeared that people had common problems because of their Africanness, if you like, the problems of racism, colonial rule, racist violence, and so on. And that's what really birthed the Pan-African movement at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And then it developed in the way that it did initially, mainly in the outside the African continent, and then gradually more and more from within the African continent. Mm -hmm. And it's always, I say in my, my book, Pan-Africanism, a history that Pan-Africanism is like a, a river, a mighty river with many different streams and currents. So the streams and currents are all flowing into the river or flowing out of the river, but not necessarily the same. So you have common problems, but not necessarily common solutions. And of course, those problems also change. 
So in 1900, the problems were different from 1945. And 1945, different from in 2000, and different now in 2023. So you're going to have different types of Pan-Africanism. Um, but you're right, in the 50s and 60s, there were some who stressed the unity of those struggles within the African continent, the need to liberate the continent from colonial rule. And then those like Nkrumah, for example, who argued that you needed a United States of Africa, that if Africa was going to stand up to the rest of the world, and particularly the old colonial powers and the new, like the big imperialist powers, that Africa needed to unite basically as, as one unit, just like the United States or the Soviet Union of that period. But that was an idea which did not find favor with everyone. There are many reasons, but certainly one was the influence of the big powers themselves that tried to obviously for their own purposes, wanted to keep Africa disunited. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but it did lead to the creation of new organizations of African states, particularly the organization of African unity, which was founded in 1963 and played quite an important role in the liberation of particularly Southern Africa, of South Africa, of Angola, Mozambique, and so on had its own liberation committee and encouraged those frontline states, as they were called, to support the armed struggle of the ANC, of ZANU, ZAPU, and others, and so on. So that was important. And of course, today you have a successor to the Organization of African Unity, the African Union, as you said. So that is one kind of Pan-Africanism, kind of official Pan-Africanism, state Pan-Africanism, if you like. But of course, the history of Pan-Africanism, it's generally been non-state Pan-Africanism. So in other words, activists who were not part of governments and so on. And that kind of Pan-Africanism still exists within the African continent, within the African diaspora, in Germany. In fact, Pan-African congresses I've come to have been in Munich, for example, which had, I'm not sure whether they're still held, but they used to have a Pan-African conference in Munich every couple of years. There were some big ones that have been held in Africa. There are smaller ones that are held in different places. So people of African heritage concerned about Africa and concerned about the issues that affect them wherever they happen to be in the world, still gather in that way, still recognize the need for Africans to unite. And even the African Union itself recognizes the entire African diaspora as part of the African Union, as its sixth region. It also recognizes Haiti the first modern independent black state as a special, has special kind of observer status within the African Union. So Pan-Africanism has a different character today. There are also kind of cultural manifestations of it. I suppose Black Lives Matter is a kind of Pan-African trend, you could say, in recent times. So that is really the way things are. And of course, these days, the way that the states operate is in a rather limited way. There's the idea now of an African free trading zone, for example, which is, you know, many African governments are embracing. So rather like the European Union, because if you explain to them that the European Union didn't do very much for the people of Europe. So these big free trade areas benefit the big states and the big monopolies. They don't benefit the people because the system which is in place is the capital centered system and that benefits the minority the majority. So it will be the same for Africa. The rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer, whether you have a free trade zone or not. But that is the kind of pan Africanism that the states are developing. Some of them are now developing visa free travel for nationals from other African states. There is some movement with well the, the whole global African reparations movement which is particularly strong in the Caribbean, but also in the US, in Britain and other countries, as well as in some African countries, is another manifestation of modern Pan-Africanism. The demand for the return of stolen, looted cultural artifacts, another dimension of Pan-Africanism today. Then there are things outside Africa, the conferences of Afro-descendants in Latin America and the recognition of Afro-descendants in countries like Argentina and Peru and Uruguay and these other countries. That's also a manifestation of Pan-Africanism. So there are different aspects according to the particular challenges and problems that are faced. But of course, I suppose the biggest challenge is the one of people's power, empowerment, yeah. decision-making power for the peoples of the African continent. And that's a big, a big ask, a big demand, which the states are not going to encourage. Mm -hmm. That has to come from, you know, people themselves. Yeah, the grassroots movement. The rights, yeah. So do you think there's like a big change coming for the African countries in the sense of their 
liberation from the established powers, from the neo-colonial system? Well, I think we, we see elements of it, don't we? So we see it in West Africa today, in you know, Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Niger. We saw it a few years ago in Egypt, uh, maybe in Tunisia, and what, what people refer to as the Arab Spring. I'm not quite sure why, it's in Africa. But, but anyway, the, these movements of people, really movements for people's empowerment against the big colonial powers for the rights of people and so on. I think these movements are, they're kind of simmering everywhere. They may break out here or they may break out there. People kind of forget about the Egyptian revolution, but it's only a few years ago. Okay, it's been suppressed by the military and their foreign allies, but these things, you can't keep the lid on these kind of things forever. And if it broke, broke out in some big state like Nigeria or wherever, then, you know, anything is possible. But certainly the conditions the kind of economic conditions and political conditions are there for it, the demand for it, the need for it. But from the point of view of people being organized and clear about what they want, exactly what they, those things probably are not there. So I think the possibility of struggles breaking out in various African countries is always, always, always likely, always likely, but how they will develop remains to be seen. And as you see, it's often the military that benefit from these struggles in the recent period. Either they come in to suppress it or they come in to lead it. Uh, I mean, Sudan is another example of revolutionary upsurges in recent years. So these things are happening all the time, but it's the how to strengthen them, how to lead them, how to develop them, how to make them successful against whether it's military governments or whether it's the foreign powers. Because we have to remember that in Libya, you had, I don't know whether you call it a revolution, but you had a, a system of government that, had, that was very different from other parts of Africa, an economic system, very different. And then the big powers just come in and smash everything up, invade it, assassinate the leader. So it's very, very difficult. These are the kind of challenges that Africa faces that the big powers just act or think they can act with impunity. And that, that's a problem. It's a problem, not just for people in Africa, but obviously for people in Europe, in the U S as to how to change the situation. Yeah. These governments can't act in this, this way, whether it's in, in Africa or in Palestine or wherever. Exactly. I, I thought sometimes when, you know, we hear, for example, Emmanuel Macron, I think when he was in Burkina Faso, where they were talking about the war, Ukraine um, and, and Russia and the Russian invasion. And a lot of African countries, I think it was 13, they were kind of withholding in um, directly call it a war or call it like unjust what Russia did. Yeah. And, and then Macron was like baffled. He was like, why do you feel... Why can't you call a war a war? And then there was all this talk about this anti-Westernism and why a lot of African countries feel like, yeah, we don't support anymore what you do or we don't do what you want us to do because you claim you do rule-based politics, but actually you just... Yeah, well, they make up the rules as they go along. <laughs> they <That's it. That's laughs> the Well, they say they're following them because they've made them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've... I mean, isn't it Nelson Mandela who famously said that your enemies are not our enemies? As mm -hmm. people said to him, why do you, why do you, you know, consult with Cuba and with Libya and whoever it was, I can't remember. He said, well, your enemies are not our enemies. You know, yeah, exactly. these, these people helped us and so on. But yeah, I mean, that's a good example, the example you've given. And it, it shows the kind of, the kind of colonial mentality of these leaders. Yeah. They think everybody thinks like them, but even in their own countries, most people don't think like them. This, why would anybody in Africa think like them? This is their yeah. the kind of white men of property. Our thinking is the world's thinking. Like they talk about these universal values, yes. but it's just their values, the values of the rich. Yeah. And the minority, no, the most of the world doesn't have those values. And I mean, they're what they call a war. If you surround the country with an aggressive military alliance and you install a government in a, in a country bordering that country and you support the most backward elements and all kinds of dubious people with, you know, fascist connections, <laughs> so, what is, you're, you're basically goading the country that you're surrounding and provoking into taking action of some kind. And then when it takes action, then you say, oh, look, you know, they, they, they're doing the, you know, it's like the, the bully in the classroom, you know, who bullies somebody every day. And then that, that child fights back 
And the teacher points to the child and said, you know, you're very bad, so, you know, but the child's been bullied for so many So this is, you know, obviously Russia is a big country, but if NATO is surrounding it and making, planting its weapons all along Russia's borders, supporting, you know, what's likely to happen. So the war is, bit, the war is provoked uh, in that way. And then uh, the leaders of NATO expect the whole world to support them. Well, why should anybody support them? That they're the ones who've, who've created the situation and are destabilizing the world and threatening Russia and threatening China too, because they're big rivals and so on. So nobody is, <laughs> but the, these present, these French presidents are kind of notorious for going to Africa and lecturing people. Uh, Sarkozy went and said, Africa has no history. Nothing's ever happened. Basically, we didn't come and civilize you. You, see, you can't even understand how they can be advised to go and say these things. Exactly. They do time and time again, they go and they operate with the same colonial mentality that people had 50, 60, 70, 80, a hundred years ago. And people in Africa and elsewhere draw the, you know, the appropriate conclusions that why would they listen to such people? Who are going to lecture them, as you as you say, and who go around invading other countries, and you know, I mean, it's it's yeah. all hypocrisy of it is 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 unbelievable. And what is worse, these people are still exploiting these countries, and they're going to lecture. So, yeah. who is going to take any notice of one of their you know people who are coming to exploit you? Yeah. Is telling you how to behave and how to act and how to think. And even though these governments may not be necessarily very progressive. They still have their, you know, their sense of dignity and so on. And sovereignty, yeah. And of sovereignty to some degree anyway. Um, there's only so much you can take <laughs> from these people. Because, yeah, they behave, like I say, as if they were still the, the colonial masters. And, I mean, at the moment, I think the German chancellor is in Africa. The, yeah. British, the British king is in Africa. Yes, it was in Kenya, right? Yeah. And also our federal president was in Tanzania. And president, he, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. not chancellor, president. Yeah. 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 He, he apologized for the Maji Maji uprising in Tanzania. But well, he yeah. shouldn't apologize for the uprising. He should apologize for what caused it. True. Yeah, I think <laughs> he probably did. Yeah. But they're really careful with using the word um, reparation. Yeah. That everybody, they're, all, they're all very concerned about it. And they're, they're just, they think they can go and say something and increase trade by doing it. But people have long memories. Yes, I think so. Also, like, I feel the mentality in a lot of African countries who were colonized changed their mind. They, they liberated them in the sense of, I don't want to hear from the white men anymore what I'm allowed to think or what I'm allowed to say. Um, yeah. So yeah. It's People don't like, want lectures. They don't yeah. want lectures from other people telling them, you know, what to think, what to do, how to behave, what values to adopt. No. Yeah, it reminded you when you told about Palestine and also France Fanon. I read that a lot of people who are supporting the guard, like it's, it's always, of course, unfortunately black and white, um, but who are more like um, supporting uh, Gaza against Israel, they are um, always coming back to Fanon and his uh, theory of that um, yeah, in the fight against colonialists, violence is an appropriate measure. I'm not sure what you think about that. If if Fanon would apply here or... Well, it is a, you know, a colonial situation where, you know, people are coming and settling on your land. And well, first of all, taking your land away, but then settling on it and, and so on. So in the end, what 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 should people do? If somebody comes to your house and steals your TV or sits there watching it and whatever, yeah, basically sits there watching it, comes into your house, brings their family and sits there down on your chairs and sleeps in your bed and eats your food and watches your TV. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You're going to say, oh, thank you. Welcome. Or are you going to throw them out? And in throwing them out, how are you going to throw them out? Are you going to say, please leave? Or are you going to kick them up the backside? So it, when this has been going on, uh, you know, 80 years or whatever, what, what are people going to do? What else can they do? I think the thing, the whole thing about Palestine is once you look at the history, everything becomes clear. There can be no confusion about what is going on because, you know, this is somebody's land, somebody's country, somebody's, which other people from somewhere else have come and settled on and then established 
their state within your, I mean, it's as if, you know, the French invaded Germany or invaded, you know, Hamburg and took over Hamburg and said, okay, we're going, this is, we're going to have this state in Hamburg and we're going to tell the people of the German people of Hamburg where they can live, which part, where they can live, they can live on these outskirts here. Well, who's going to accept that? Nobody's going to accept that. And the thing about Palestine is that the, the big other big powers have assisted all of this from even before the 1940s, because, you know, Palestine was a British colony, we can say technically a mandate under the League of Nations, but in effect, a colony and the British rulers of it encouraged the settlers to come from Europe, um, you know, going right back to, you know, the Balfour in 1917, but here you can go back to the 19th century and Palmerston and you can take Zionism back to British prime ministers in the 1850s were advocating Zionism and so on. So it has a Britain has been completely engaged in this for, for so long and has carried out such a massive, massive crime there. But then again, it's being perpetuated today by all the big powers, principally by the US, but also by Britain, by France and by others. And it's completely unjust. The Palestinian people must have their rights. They're, they're entitled to live in their own land. I mean, that's the basis of it. You are, they are entitled to their own land. And to the right of self-determination as any nation is entitled to. And that has to be accepted and recognized and so on. And it isn't. And even the declarations that UN has, has made to contain the settlers are being broken because the Israeli state is encouraging and facilitating new settlements, even on the land, which has been apportioned, you could say wrongly to the Palestinian people. So the whole thing is completely, people like to say, you know, there's kind of two sides to it. There, there are two sides. There's this very, very simple issue. And it's one of the great sort of crimes of the 20th century, which is continued in the 21st century. And then on top of that, you have all this nonsense about antisemitism. Hmm. Just complete, this can, has nothing to do with the question at all. It's a simply a colonial question, a question of history. Everybody can look into and see the situation and so on and so forth. And you cannot say that criticizing any government in the world is racism. If you criticize an African government, nobody says you're racist. And people do it all the time. They so say, all these African governments, they're this, they're that. No one says you're their racist. So you're criticizing a government. You should be able to criticize a government. If you criticize the German government, nobody accuses you of racism. Or well, the British government. It's just, it's completely ridiculous that such an idea can be applied to. And of course you see, don't we, we see on social media, so many Jewish people saying, oh, this has got nothing to do with us. It's mm. got nothing to do with Judaism. This is a political issue of Zionism, which we don't agree with, which we think is against our religion. We don't subscribe to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the situation is clear. But as usual, the powers that be try and muddy the waters and confuse people as to what is going on and what has been going on since 1917 and before. Yeah. I think this kind of anti-Semitism applies in so far that when people criticize Israel, sometimes they do that to imply that Israel don't have a right to exist. And I think then it, it applies that this is anti-Semitism because I, I, I think as Palestine, they have the right to have a country. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They have the right. But you see, this is, this is, this is the thing. People deny the Palestinians the right to exist. This is the issue. This is why it's denied that Palestinians are denied the right to exist and they're denied the right to have a state. Yes. They're denied the right to have a state. They don't have a state and they don't have the right to self-determination and they don't even have the right to exist because there's a, you know genocide going on. So this is the actual crime. And rather than focus on the crime, the, the concentration, or there's an effort to concentrate on those who are committing the crime and say, look, committing the crime have, the, have some rights. So the people committing crimes don't have rights. So you would say Pat Fanon applies here. That's the... it's, like saying, it's like saying the British colonial rulers, you know, have, have the right to exist. Does the, the British colonial rule have the right to exist? No, it doesn't have any right to exist. Did French colonial rule have the right to exist? No, it 
Did German colonial rule have the right to do this? No, it didn't. And whatever means the people of Namibia or Tanzania or Nigeria or Algeria used to get rid of that colonial power, that was completely legitimate. The absolute right to do whatever they wish to do in their own country. We have to remember that the colonial states are states of violence. They're invading entities. Nobody invited the French to go into Algeria. They invaded Algeria. And they maintain their presence there by violence. That's what colonial rule was, violence. So how are you going to get rid of a violent occupation? Unless you, unfortunately, you have to resort to a liberation struggle which uses force. You know, again, people, people like to use the word violence. But when you talk about the colonial states, people don't use the term violence. But it's the colonial state which is violent. Colonial colonialism is violent and that's what the people of Africa wanted to get rid of and did get rid of and by using any means that they could to do that including forceful means because the illegitimate invasions and the, the, the colonial systems that had been set up would not leave unless they were forced to do so and so people forced them to leave as far as they could at that particular time and that was perfectly legitimate just as during the uh, times of slavery when people rebelled against slavery, they were perfectly legitimate. Yeah. If they killed those who claimed to own them, that was also perfectly legitimate. <laughs> and those were the arguments that people had in the you know, 19th century, 18th century. And the, the, the champions of those who were enslaved in Britain, for example, that's what they argued. To rise up and get rid of the person who is denying you rights, claiming ownership of you as a human being is completely just. And that is correct, it is. Yeah, I also read that in the future projects, you want to focus on anti-colonial struggle. So also in this kind of how colonialism is still happening today, or mostly in the liberation movement. Well, looking probably at the period from 1945 to maybe about 25 years, maybe something like that. In 1945, there was a very famous Congress held in Manchester in this country, Pan-African Congress. Yeah. where the delegates to that Congress set out a vision of a future Africa, an Africa without colonial borders, mm -hmm. without political institutions of colonial rule, without the capital-centered economic system, and in which the masses of the people played a decisive role, a key role. So that vision has not yet been realized. You know, they set out on that path in 1945. And so what happened? What happened in those 25 years when these struggles were being waged and so on? So the aim of the book is to look at that struggle, how far it got, what prevented it arriving at its final destination, why people like Nkrumah and others who were at Kenyatta and others who were at that Congress were unable to realize their aims, what was the impact of the Cold War on all that, and also what were the kind of networks and movements that existed, not just in Africa, but also within the diaspora, particularly in Britain, organizations like Staff and Students Union, West Africa National Secretary and, and others, what role did they play in developing Pan-African networks, which tried to assist in this process. So that's the general idea of my next project. Yeah. It's kind of sort of Pan-Africanism and anti-communism. You can think of it as. Anti-communism? Yes, because the Cold War is a, basically a period of anti-communism. Ah. It made it more difficult for people to create alternatives to the colonial systems. Because if you said, okay, well, we want to have a different economic system. You're a communist. Yeah. We'll, we'll put you in prison. So in other words, there was a lot of pressure for people not to see, not to go down alternative routes, but to kind of stay within the box of colonial rule. So I like, want to look at that whole process. Why did that happen? Why did this kind of struggle for independence and for empowerment, how was it subverted, if you like? Why didn't it come to fruition? But also what efforts were made during that period to try and realize that vision of a new Africa. That's the kind of idea of it. Yeah. When I did my videos about uh, Jan Krumer or Samara Machel or Lumumba, um, they always kind of got to, at a certain point to stem uh, communists. Um, yeah. And then this Suddenly, the Western powers, they had the right to yeah, overthrow them or assassinate them because they are like a threat to humanity because they are colonists. Even though they were 
maybe not. They were maybe just non-aligned or they were just posing, yeah, challenging the system, as you say. Yeah. Well, that's, the, so that's the kind of idea of it. That's cool. That sounds good. Thank you. I'm glad I have your seal of approval. Very important. Yeah, also like checking your article. I, I already learned so much. For example, you had that article about the Negro Workers Conference in Hamburg. Yes, in very Hamburg. important. Hamburg is so important. I did not know about this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very, very important. And in fact, the International Trade Union Committee of Negro Workers was based in Hamburg for about three years. Wow. People like George Padmore were based in Hamburg. James Ford from the US based in Hamburg. Yeah, it was the center of the universe, Hamburg. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, I already got so many new perspectives and ideas. I think there's a lot of research I can do on, on the, yeah. the African history in Germany. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's everywhere, right? This is like what initially you said that we can't just uh, erase yeah, African history or history of uh, black people, people of color from, from countries. They are not hundred percent made by white people. Well, definitely not by the white men of property, which is how things are generally presented. Uh, and sometimes when you, you look at history through a different lens or from the perspective of different people, you sometimes learn much more about the history of a country. You know, in Britain, we have in the 18th century, we have a very big movement against slavery, against human trafficking, in which Africans played a very important role, but lots of other people played an important role. It was one of the first mass political movements. Women were very much involved. Workers were involved. But it's a movement that's so big, nobody, hardly anybody ever talks about it. Okay? If you go to school in Britain, you would never learn that millions of people signed petitions against slavery. People boycotted sugar, wouldn't take it in their tea, their coffee, and so on. So how is that possible? That you have this massive political movement and nobody talks about it. Nobody knows about it. Okay? So... Once you look at that, you, you, you get a kind of different picture of Britain and its history. That, well, why, why were people so concerned about slavery? You know, why did they take that stand? Why were workers involved? What were the politics of the people involved? It gives you a whole different perspective on the history of Britain. And there, there are many other examples. Yeah, I think those voices or just kind of digging forgotten history is very important for representation and, yeah, to open the minds and the hearts of the people. I think it, it's just very enriching if you uh, just consider different perspectives. It, it's just, for me, also very boring to think about history as something, as you say, the white man of property did, which is first of all not true, and second of all, it's boring. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, it was uh, really fascinating. I, I, I already got like thousands of new things to research, so it was a pleasure and an honor, and I'm very happy that you agreed to talk to me. Um, I, and that was all my pleasure. Thank you for it. Yeah. I mean, we had a good discussion and covered a lot of ground. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be invited and have such provocative questions in a, in a good way. Questions that are you know, relevant and pertinent. We discussed some topical things, some historical things, lots of different issues. So no, thank you so much for inviting me and good luck with all your, all your work in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching.